everybody. Let's let's get started. I know it's the first day back from break, but um, this is a relatively casual day for you. You just got to listen. All right. And here's what we're doing. Um, today, we will know the story of Oedipus Rex. This is a very famous play, arguably the most famous play ever. Um, it was written around 400 BC. Actually, about 450 BC, but 400 is good enough. 400 BC by a guy named Sophocles. All right. And the reason I want to tell you the story of Oedipus Rex is starting tomorrow. It doesn't matter whether you have Gonzales or whether you have me or whether you're first period or whether you're an eighth period. But starting tomorrow, we will read the sequel called Antigone. Okay, not Antigon, Antigone. All right, and. Um, but in order to better understand Antigone and where she's coming from, and this is a character in the play, and you know, I'll talk about her too, you need to understand the story before, which is Oedipus Rex. We're not going to read that play. Today you're going to hear that whole story. Okay? And I will try to draw it up here as I go. And this is going to, I'll guarantee you, one of the craziest stories you've ever heard. Okay? Guaranteed. Really? No, I don't know. Look, look, you, you, wait, you wait and see. You wait and see. Alright, so Oedipus, Oedipus Rex has also become um, sort of a, uh, a, a, a template, a story that other stories have drawn on in the past. Particularly if you're one of my students, I don't know how well Gonzalez does this, but we spent a lot of time in Kite Runner where I was showing you how um, the author used Bible stories to make his story Kite Runner better. All right, or I showed you how the Bible stories showed up in um, Of Mice and Men also. <clears throat> Oedipus Rex is one of those kind of stories where modern or more modern stories use pieces and parts from Oedipus Rex to tell their stories. Okay, so it is a story that is alluded to. Those are called allusions with an A. So here's the story of Oedipus Rex. As I'm going along, feel free to ask questions, okay, and stop and make sure you understand it. It's a sequel, okay? So Antigone is a sequel. So, you know, you got to kind of understand the first story to understand the second story better. So if you don't understand something, feel free to ask, stop me, and, uh, and we'll keep going. All right, Oedipus Rex. This all started... The Oedipus Rex started, uh, the story of Oedipus Rex started long before the play. Okay, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about right now is actually before the play of Oedipus Rex. And then I'll talk about the play itself, and I'll show you how that leads into Antigone, which we start tomorrow. So here's how it started. Oedipus comes from a family, <clears throat> that's not good comes from a family called Cadmus. That's the family name, the line of Cadmus. Okay? And many generations ago, okay, so the story takes place in 400 BC. We'll just make this up a little bit. Somewhere around 800, well, it's probably not quite that much, 600 BC, Cadmus, okay, the founding father of this family kills Cadmus kills Apollo kills Apollo's pet snake Apollo is a god okay so he's a Greek god <clears throat> and Cadmus kills his snake pisses off Apollo, okay, totally. I mean, he's like, really, you killed my sacred snake, and this, you know, done. Don't mess with the gods, because Apollo, yeah, worse than that, Thomas. Apollo then curses the family of Cadmus. Well, you haven't even seen the beginning here, really. He curses the family of Cadmus forever. <coughs> All right? So the early message here is the early message from this kind of ancient 
Greek story is that um, don't mess with the gods. All right? Don't mess with the gods because they will put you down. And so what Apollo does is Apollo curses Cadmus, the family of Cadmus. And one of the curses that um, Apollo puts on the family of Cadmus is that if you have a male son, that child will grow up and kill the father. Pretty bad curse. But he makes the curse even worse by saying, if you have a male son, he will grow up and kill the father and marry the mother. Okay? So, this family lives with this curse for a long time, and eventually the family of Cadmus is led by a king, okay, whose name is King Laius. And I want to make sure I spell his name right, so hold on one second. L-A-I-U-S. L-A-I-U-S. All right. King Laius is married to, so he's the king. Let's put a little crown on there for him. Right? He's the king. There's his crown. And he's married to Jocasta. <laughs> All right. Jocasta and King Laius are the king and queen of Thebes. This is the town, the city state, if you will. I'm going to call it a town for now. All right? So King Laius and Queen Jocasta are queen and, and king and queen of the city of Thebes, okay, an ancient Greek town. And what happens is um, Jocasta gets pregnant, and they're worried, right? They're worried about the curse. Right? Laius's great 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 grandfather killed Apollo's snake, and so suddenly <clears throat> they're pregnant and worried, okay? Um, Jocasta and Laius end up having a son by the name of Oedipus. Now, as, as you can imagine, this is a terrifying moment for the family, right? Great, here's a son. He's going to grow up and kill Laius and sleep with Mary Jocasta, right? Panicked. What would you do? What would you do Kill if you were Laius? What? Kill the kid. You guys are cold-blooded. Would oh, you just like the second is born, you just take it out, bam, on the ground? Is that what you're talking about? Hold on, hold on. A little more humane, what would you have? Drown them? Put them in a bag with a bunch of rocks, tie it up, and throw them in the lake? <laughs> Okay, ready? Ready? So, instead, instead of, instead of flat out killing them, like some people, and I don't know about you, Denise, how about you, kind of cold-blooded back there? What would you do? I don't know. You don't know? I know, it's a, quite a problem. <laughs> Alright, so, so, unlike 
Unlike Thomas and some of the rest of you. You know what? If the kid was going to kill me, I'd kill him first. Okay, I got it. I got it. You're legit. Instead, you can have an yes. Drop him off of an orphanage. You got a better idea? But then he's going to kill you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I can't hear. I said it was a no word. Put baby in the box. I'll mail it to myself. Oh my gosh. This is kind of All right, so instead. Instead, <laughs> instead, Jocasta, Jocasta and Laius, you know, look at their new son and they think, look, we need to get rid of them, but we can't kill them. They're not as cold-blooded as you guys. So instead, instead, Jocasta and Laius take Oedipus and they give him to a shepherd. Okay. They give him the little baby, and they say to the to the shepherd, they say, "You take this little baby and go and leave it on Mount Cithaeron." Hold on. We're carrying a baby on top of it. Okay. So. Jocasta and Leia say, take our, take our infant son and leave him up on the mountainside. That way, we didn't actually kill him. He just died on his own. And he gets raised by Okay. And, and the, key, the key here is Jocasta and Leia <coughs> try to beat Apollo, beat Apollo's curse. By getting rid of the baby, okay? And this is key to these stories, is this idea of God's laws versus mankind's free will. Do gods have more power, or do the men, humans, have power? Oh, we, we and ultimately, ultimately, this is where this story is heading, and it's also in Antigone. This is why you need to understand the sequel. All right, or understand the prequel, actually, to understand Oedipus Rex, is this whole idea of men versus gods. The law of men versus the law of gods. The will of the gods versus the will of human beings. All right? And if you think about it, that's kind of been, that's a common kind of theme throughout all stories, through tons of stories. Who kind of, who is, who has more power? And you'll see, and we'll talk about more of those stories as we read um, Antigone. So anyway, back to the story. So the shepherd goes up onto the mountainside and um, runs into another shepherd who lives on the other side of the mountain. All right? So he's going up there. What did I say? And he runs into this other shepherd. And he says, he suddenly gets kind of cold feet too and says, you know, I just can't leave this baby here to die. I will give the baby to you. All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know. They are all here. All right. Cool. Uh, except for one. Yeah, that one. Wow, dude, where have you been? All right, here we go. <coughs> so, so. Shepherd number one gives the baby to shepherd number two. And the shepherd number two takes care of Alright, so shepherd, shepherd number two feels sorry for this little tiny baby and decides to not leave it on the mountainside and not let it die. Alright? And he takes it back down to his town which is called Corinth. I bet they have one. What if they just kept the baby? Would it actually kill it? Well, you know, you're messing with the gods, so it's a good question, but they, you know, they they're, they feel, I think, that the gods are so powerful, Apollo is so powerful, that he could make this happen. And so they're so terrified of, of this, and, and rightfully so, that, that they get rid of them. It's just scary. Okay. Okay. Let me keep going because there's quite a bit more to this story. So, when the second shepherd arrives in Corinth, 
he goes and talks to the king and queen of Corinth. Okay, <laughs> his names are Polybus, King Polybus, and his queen Merope. Okay, and Polybus and Merope have not been able to have a child for a long time, which is a big deal if you're the king, right? Because who are you going to pass your kingdom on to? Well, you're just uh, so they they you can't. Hold on, yeah. hold on. So the baby, the baby, they end up giving the little baby, who we've been drawn in black, so we'll keep him in black. This little baby, there he is in his little, his little hands out there. What are you trying, Miss? It's just the baby is wrapped up in a blanket. They give the little baby to the king and queen of of Corinth. All right. Meanwhile, over here in Thebes, everything's fine, right? They got rid of the baby. Jocasta and Laius are still king and queen of of Corinth. Everything's grand. Oedipus. Oedipus grows up in Corinth, and he's the, he's the, as far as he knows, he's the prince for the king and queen of Corinth. He's growing up to be, um, he's going to become the, he's going to become the king, give him a little crown. He's on his way to becoming king. Nobody knows, right, except for, I mean, nobody knows except for the shepherds what really happened. And Polybus and Merope, they don't really know either because all they know is they got a new baby and it's all fine. And, and Jocasta and Laius, they're happy because their baby's gone and they're still king and queen of Thebes and everything's great. All right? Until. Until. Back in Thebes, suddenly there is a plague. All right, and things are bad. Okay, everything's really bad, and King Laius decides I need to do something about it. And King Laius says I'm going to go to the Oracle at Delphi, and I'll put that on here in a second. I'm going to go to the Oracle at Delphi and ask them, ask the gods through the why are we under a plague? Save us from the plague. Okay? This is terrible. It's awful. What? Perhaps. Alright? Um, and the plague, the plague in this case, is brought on by a character called a sphinx. Okay? And a sphinx. Here we go. A sphinx has the head of a lion. This is my lion. And an eagle body. Yeah, eagle body. Dragon. 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 <laughs> Ready? And and the Sphinx the Sphinx is called caused this terrible plague on, on the city of Thebes. And being the good king that he is, he wants to figure out how to get rid of this plague, how to get rid of the Sphinx. So Laius So Laius heads off to the Oracle at Delphi, okay? This is where this is where in ancient Greek culture you would go to talk to the gods. Laius goes to talk to the gods, he heads off to Delphi to ask the gods for help. 
All right? So, so he goes to ask the gods for help. Why is this sphinx plaguing us? Why are our crops dying? Why are our people dying? Help us out. All right? Meanwhile, meanwhile, over in Corinth, little prince Oedipus here, he goes to, uh, he goes off to this bar. Where he hears, where he hears that he is in fact not the son of King Polybus and Queen Merope, okay, and in fact, um, he finds out or he hears kind of through rumor from this guy in the bar, and so it's a little kind of sketchy, but he finds out that in fact he is prophesized to grow up and kill his father and sleep with his mother. Oedipus hears of the curse. All right? Now, Oedipus has grown up in this family the whole his whole life, has no idea that he's adopted, right? So, of course, Oedipus is thinking, I don't want to grow up and kill my father and sleep with my mother. That's terrible, and that's just plain gross. So, so Oedipus decides to leave Corinth to head off to the Oracle at Delphi to find out what he needs to do. So, Laius is heading to Delphi. Oedipus is heading to Delphi, all right? And he's probably about, you know, I mean, he's older now. Like, he, uh, uh, you're old enough, you get to see it, okay? So, here's what happens. They're coming along. Oedipus is coming down this road. Or, I mean, sorry, uh, Laius is coming down this road. And Oedipus is coming down this road, and there's actually three roadways here. <coughs> and they meet. Now, they don't know each other at all, right? I mean, Oedipus was sent away when he was an infant, a couple days old. He spent his whole life growing up over here in Corinth. Laius thinks that his son that he had is dead, right? He's like, well, I left him up on the mountainside. He's dead. They have no idea who they are, okay? And they run into each other, quite literally, actually. Laius, in his, Laius, in his, in his chariot, is my horse. Wind blowing out because he's racing it's along. A <laughs> it's a pony. It is a pony. Well, you know. And Oedipus quite literally crash right into each other. Actually, what happens is at Laius's um, chariot runs over Oedipus. Um, Oedipus kind of like brushes him back out of the way. Oedipus gets pissed, hits the hits Laius. The quick fight ensues. And Oedipus kills Laius. Oh, I know. I know. Are you recording this? Why? Wow. Wow. So, the point. Okay. So, here's where it gets weird. So, Oedipus. Oedipus kills Laius. He doesn't know who it is. He has no idea. All right, and and neither, and he kills the all the guys that are with him. So there's actually no witnesses. Well, there's one who escapes, but we don't really know much about him. He kind of escapes. After all this, Laius or uh, Oedipus, after he kills Laius, 
he knows he can't go back to Corinth because he wants to avoid killing his dad, who's not really his dad, and sleeping with his mom, who's not really his mom. Instead, he goes back up this road, and where does he end up? Thieves. Now, still with me? Okay, it's getting a little messy up here, so you got to kind of watch what's going on, all right? Um, and we have this on film, so I'm going to erase this part so I can talk about what happens in Thebes. You okay with that? All right. Yeah, you want to take a picture real quick? Brian. Yeah. I know, I'll keep the cat. <laughs> Other people are okay, now. Now. Are we ready? Now, now Laius, or I'm sorry, Oedipus confronts the Sphinx. He walks into town and he sees that Thebes is still under a plague from the Sphinx, right? Because Laius never made it back to, to figure out what's wrong there. So Oedipus Oedipus walks into the, to Thebes and sees the Sphinx, okay? Much more terrifying than the one I drew. And the Sphinx has a deal with the people of Thebes. If you can answer this riddle, I will leave and I'm going to, I will leave and the city will return back to normal. And the people of Thebes say, if anyone can answer this riddle, we will make them king. Cool, here's the riddle. What walks on four legs? A horse. Okay, if you know it, can you stop? What walks on four legs in the morning? Uh, two legs during the day. And three legs at night. This is the Sphinx's riddle. Okay? What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at the day, and three legs at night? Now, Oedipus, being a really wise guy, actually answers the riddle. What is the answer? It's a human. It's a human. How is it a human? Four legs as a child, two legs as a, a kid up to an adult, and then three legs, which is a cane as an adult. Uh, it's old. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I was right about it being a correction, but I thought it was something Let's take a look at it really quick. Okay? This will stay on the video so you can see it, but you do want to know it. All right? And here's what. Here's what um, Alex is talking about. Okay, what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the day, and three legs at night? Well, it, the answer is man, mankind. Okay, when I say man, I mean humans. Now, don't forget, these plays are all based on the idea of man versus gods. In this case, mankind versus the Sphinx. But the answer to the riddle is man. I'm going to fill in some other background about Greeks later in the week that you can understand why this is such an important theme for them. All right, But Sophocles writes it into his play. And here's how it works. As a baby, you crawl. So you're on four legs. right? Throughout the middle of your life, you walk on two legs most people, right? And as you get older, you get a cane, 
right? So three legs, all right? I drew it as a cycle. Morning, day, night. Because this is a metaphor, this is a metaphor that's used in literature all the time, right? This idea that morning is sort of the beginning and, and, and daytime and nighttime. Morning meaning you're young when you're a baby, daytime when you're middle aged, all the way through till you're old, night, all right? But it also works, this cycle also works with the seasons. Spring. Right? If you think of spring, like for flowers and plants and all that, it's when things are just starting to grow. It's kind of like a baby. It's kind of like morning. Daytime, which would be summer, right? And it kind of works for the seasons as well, right? In the middle of the, your life cycle when you're alive and, you know, young and we're all in this phase right now. Um, kind of equals day, you could go on the 24 hour cycle, or it could go on the 365 day cycle, where this is summer, fall, similarly. Um, fall, um, getting older, right, leaves, if you think of plants and stuff, they're beginning to drop their leaves and all that kind of stuff, and of course, death. So this cycle can go on a 24-hour cycle or a 365-day cycle. Or a human lifetime. It's a metaphor for life. Alright, it is a metaphor for life. But what's interesting is that the answer to the riddle is man. Mankind. As I said before, all these plays are about humans versus the gods. So that the, the fact that the, the riddle is also about the humans versus gods is interesting, and that the answer is man is also interesting. Because look at what has just happened. Jocasta and Laius think they beat the gods. Oedipus, when he leaves Corinth, thinks he beat the gods. But as it ends up, they didn't. Because the gods controlled Laius' fate and had Laius' son actually kill him. The gods also controlled Oedipus' fate and they send him off. They, you know, through his fate, he goes to Thebes, answers the riddle of the Sphinx, and becomes king. That's why that king should have been killed in the first place. Now, <laughs> Ready? Because Oedipus answers the riddle of the Sphinx and becomes king, the city of Thebes says, well, now that you're king, we'll give you a queen. Yeah. Now, are we good? Now, this is actually where this is actually where the play Oedipus Rex begins. Okay, after all this happens, the play Oedipus Rex begins, and it begins with the city of Thebes being under a new plague. Because. They're under a new plague because they never found, never solved the old king, Laius's They never solved the, 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 the murder of King Laius. That's why they're under a new plague. Since Oedipus is now king of Thebes, it becomes his job to solve the murder of King Laius. And that, that is the entire play of Oedipus Rex, is Oedipus, the new king, out there trying to figure out who really killed King Laius. You. Now. It's the butler. Okay. Okay. Now. 
Now, by the end of the play, Oedipus finds out that it was, in fact, him that killed his own father. He finds out that he's been sleeping with, and in fact has children with, his wife. His wife, his wife slash mother, Jocasta. All right. Now they, they have. Ready? They have Jocasta and Laius have four children. Okay. Wait, do they have a son? Do they have a son? Who's a boy? Polynesius. No? He's also a boy. And then they have two girls. Esmini. <coughs> and Antigone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, by the end of the play, by the end of the play, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus finds out the whole truth. Okay? Jocasta hangs herself when she finds out. She's like, oh my god, it's my son. It's... So she kills herself. Oedipus, Oedipus stabs out his own eyes. Okay. He goes into he goes into the room where Jocasta has hung herself. He takes the pins out of her uh, toga, right? These big stick pins that hold it together, and he gouges out his own eyes as punishment for what he's done. Now, one could argue that it's not really his fault. The gods did it to him, all right. And it all goes back to the fact that they killed Apollo's snake way back when. The story we're going to read is about these four, all right? And um, as a little preview, uh, Polynesius and Antiochus end up killing each other in battle, and we'll see this at the beginning of the new play. And Espony and Antigone try to decide whether they should want, uh, let me say it better, uh, Polynesius fought for Thebes, Antiochus, oh, my dad, I have backwards. Antiochus fought for Thebes. Polynesius fought for another country, fighting, trying to fight Thebes. Polynesius does not get a hero's burial. Antiochus does, and that's the whole story of Antigone. Is Antigone trying to get uh, Polynesius to get an honorable burial? All right. It's important that you knew what happened to Oedipus to produce Antigone before we start that. Okay? And we're going to start Antigone tomorrow.